Let's do a glasses off day. Who's that? <laughs> Crazy, I see perfect close. It's just blurbs around the auditorium now. <laughs> so if you guys want to mouth something at me, go right ahead, because I'm not gonna I'm not gonna see it. You know, I wanted to start a message series and, and was moved to title it Living Here. Today I thought we'd talk from John chapter 17 and also a little from Matthew chapter 26. Because we are living in this world, we're living here. A anybody doubt that, that we're living here? Okay, see that? I always start out with a point that everybody can agree to. We are living here, but we are not from this world. This is in our home. John chapter 17 records for us this prayer of Jesus. It's a prayer he prayed on the night that he would be betrayed and arrested. Let me read to you John 17, verse 1. After Jesus says this, said this, and this is what he previously said in chapter 16. Uh, after Jesus said this, in chapter 16, he talked about the disciples and that they would be persecuted. He talked about them receiving the Holy Spirit. He told them that their grief of his leaving would turn into joy. He told them that they would have peace. He also said, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. After Jesus said this, that's the this, he looked towards heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come, glorify your son that your son may glorify you. Now John records these words, but John doesn't tell us a lot about the emotion that Jesus is feeling. But the Gospel of Matthew gives us much more detail around how Jesus felt in this moment of his life. So before we unpack this prayer from Jesus in John 17, I want us to understand the feelings and the emotions that Jesus had that night. And Matthew 26 helps us do that. So we'll jump from John 17 to Matthew 26. This is happening on the same night. Here Matthew 20, here's Matthew 26, verses 36 to 39. Then Jesus went to his disciples, then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. So in the final night of his life, as we look at these scriptures, we learn from Jesus how to pray when we feel overwhelmed. He said to the point of death, what Jesus is describing here is absolute emotional despair. Now let me ask you, when you hear Jesus describe himself that way, what does it do to you? Do you say, man, I, I didn't know he was that weak. Does it say to you, man, he fu fully was fully God and fully man. But for some, I think it makes us really uncomfortable. Because we have this perception in our minds that Christians aren't supposed to feel that way. In fact, the advice Jesus might get from other Christians is, come on now, don't feel like that. You know, you shouldn't feel that way. In fact, many, many of us grew up in churches where you're taught to smile and say everything is well, no matter what. 
And if the devil doesn't like it, he can sit on attack. <laughs> it's kind of what we grew up with to do in church. But here we have Jesus, and he's raw, and he's emotional, and he's overwhelmed, and he faces a very difficult future, like now. It's been kind of strange since the 2020 presidential election held in November. And no matter what side you're on, there is uncertainty, Brian used that word, at where this, this country is going at where we'll be, at our, at our very own freedoms. And no matter what side you're on, it's uncertain. And then we'll throw on top of that COVID. And yeah, you're right, Brian, it was a crazy 2020. There is uncertainty, deep worry about our country and its people. And 2020 has come to an end and our issues are not going away overnight due to an election or even a vaccine. They're still here. So I know that there's at least part of you that wants to hear that it's okay. It'll all be better in the morning and over the last several months, that's exactly the things we talked about in our messages here from God's word. But what about those who still need to be honest and to cry out to God in prayer? What about having the courage to tell someone, it's not okay with me. I'm at the end of my rope. See, there are, there are times when you are overwhelmed with emotion. And it doesn't make you less spiritual or less of a Christian. Folks, it makes you like Jesus on this night in his life. And I know it's important for some of us to hear that because you grew up in a home where that wasn't always allowed. And you knew that it was probably sinful if you were sad. It's probably sinful if you were anxious or angry or especially upset, those emotions weren't allowed. And so you got really good at avoiding or suppressing those feelings because it was the Christian thing to do. And I'm fine, couldn't be better, I'm great, never had a bad day in my life. That's what we said when somebody at church asked us how we were doing. Great. Just great. But here Jesus shows us that when we feel that way, we can take those things to God in prayer. Maybe you were never taught that that was okay. So maybe you develop other ways to deal with your struggle. And maybe that's how you're dealing with things right now. Maybe you're struggling this year with an addiction. Maybe you're struggling with being alone. Maybe you started drinking again. Maybe it's pornography. Maybe you fix all your problems by going online shopping spree and then you feel better. I won't tell you who I know this from, but I know someone who fixes all their problems with a big spoon and digging into the ice cream right from the carton. What's wrong with that? It's hey! <laughs> Kelly grew up in a good family. <laughs> Some jump from relationship to relationship. My family, you just started screaming about everything. And you had a better point because you were louder. My sister-in-law, Liz, when she first came into the family, went out on the porch and cried because she wondered why everybody was hollering at everyone else. <laughs> and I said, no, 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 we're just talking. <laughs> okay. But we do all have our ways to self-medicate. And sometimes we don't know why we do what we do. And we find that 
For most of us, we're just trying to deal with these unwanted emotions. And we don't know what to do. We don't know what to do with those emotions. And we hate feeling lonely, and we hate feeling powerless, and we hate feeling out of control, and we hate feeling vulnerable, and we hate feeling sad, and we hate feeling depressed, and so we self-medicate. We scream. We hide. Huh. Not, not going to ever talk to her again. And it's also all the crazy stuff going on around us. Many times we try and handle this stuff by a process we call transference. That's the psychiatric word, transference. Transference is when we redirect our feelings and our emotions onto somebody around us. I think a lot in this season we don't want to do that, but it's where we find ourselves taking our emotions out on someone else. Anybody ever did that? Come on, you can do a little hand raise. <laughs> I know a guy who told me about sitting in a marriage counselor's office the first year of his marriage. His wife was constantly angry with him about the financial insecurity that they had. He was working hard, doing the best, but he yet to be established in his career, newlyweds, he also had a part-time job on the weekend, which caused her to complain that he was never home. Couser helped him see that a lot of the anger from his wife was not really at him, but had to do with a lot from the home in which she grew up. Her dad left the family when she was young, left her sister and her siblings, completely left them to fend for themselves. Money was always tight. Electricity would often get turned off, not enough food, bill collectors calling on the phone. The therapist said to the wife, you know, it's like your dad racked up this huge bill and, and you're making your husband pay for it. The wife didn't know what to do with those emotions, so she transferred those emotions onto her husband. Didn't even know that she was doing it. And maybe there's a lot of that kind of thing at play in our homes and in our relationships. You don't know how to deal with your emotions, so you kind of take it out on those around you. Anybody ever hear you always hurt the one you love? Yeah. Oh, yeah. They're an easy target. They're right there. Folks, what Jesus does for us in John 17 and Matthew 26 is show us what to do when we feel that way. Instead of trying to numb ourselves, instead of trying to self-medicate, instead of transferring our emotions onto other people, see what Jesus does here. And yes, he practices transference. But he transfers the weight of what he's going through over to God in prayer. We'll unpack that a little bit more, but before we leave Matthew 26, don't miss this piece. It's that Jesus tells his closest friends how he's feeling. Matthew 26, 38 says, he said to them, remember it's Peter, James, and John, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. do that? How many of us can come here on a Sunday morning and say that? Wow. Jesus tells his disciples exactly how he's feeling and then he asks them to stay with him. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Friend, I need you to stay here and keep watch with me. Jesus tells them how he's feeling, 
He asks them to stay with him. And I got to tell you, that is a hard thing for us to do. But when you humble yourself in that way, you are following the example of Jesus. And if it's okay for him to do that, it is okay for you to do it also. I know some are watching here right now. Some will see this message later who are overwhelmed. Some may have even thought of hurting themselves. I talked to one this week. And if that is you, God wants you to hear this from me right now. As I prepared this message, I think Satan said, didn't want me to say what I am going to say right now. And he's fighting really hard to keep you in darkness and to cloud your thinking, to convince you that there's no hope, that there's no point, that no one really cares. And I wanted to make sure you hear me say that he is a liar. And there is hope, and there is a point, and you have a purpose, and you are loved. And God wants you to know that right now, that he sees you. And he knows how you feel. That one night in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus felt that way too. If you need it, reach out to the Father in prayer. Reach out to someone who knows Jesus as Lord and Savior and tell them how you're feeling. Give them the opportunity to love on you. If you don't have someone like that, call me. Our number's on the website. Contact us at 183church.org. Talk to someone who loves Jesus because they love you too, no matter how alone you feel. You know, in John chapter 17, we see Jesus begins his prayer with one word. John 17, 1 again, after Jesus said this, he looked to heaven and prayed. Here's the word. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. Word here is Father. And it says so much. It tells us about the kind of prayers we are invited to pray in the darkest moments, moments of our life. Jesus begins with Father. Mark's Gospel points out that Jesus uses the word Abba here, most intimate word for God. It's like saying Dad or Daddy. So here's what Jesus does. He practices transference. But instead of transferring his emotions and lashing out in stress to people around him, he transfers the weight over to God, Father. John 17, 1 to 5. After Jesus said this, he looked towards heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that your Son may glorify you. Verse 2. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Verse 4. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. Now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Jesus prays, bring me into the glory I shared with you before earth began. Here's the easiest way to think of this prayer. Jesus says, Dad, when you're ready, I'm ready to come home. You know, home, that safe place, home is that sanctuary where you feel protected. Jesus has experienced the full struggle of this life, but he knows it's not his home. So he prays to God the Father, and that's one of the truths he's acknowledging. As he prays, he's saying, this isn't home. Our home is with the Father. 
Here on earth, when we're in prayer, we are reminded we're here. We're not home. We're living here. And it's a constant theme throughout the New Testament. All throughout the New Testament, believers are encouraged that we're living here, but here isn't home. Philippians 3.20 refers to Christians as citizens of heaven. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Peter chapter 2, the Apostle Peter is writing to Christians that are under severe persecution from the government. 1 Peter 2, 11 and 12. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles. Guess what we are here? We're foreigners and exiles. To abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live, in su live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Foreigners and exiles. Peter encouraged them that they are temporarily travelers, they're sojourners. They're here but not home yet. And every time we pray to God as Father, every time we cry out to him as Father, about the challenges and the struggles of this world, we're reminding ourselves that this is temporary, that this isn't home. And there's things while we're away that we need to do. To live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Many of you know that my secular job, I work in Western Pennsylvania. I do have a residence in Jamestown, New York, Western New York. We get all of those snows that come off of Lake Erie, crazy snows, start snowing and an hour later there's 18 inches of snow on the ground. I spend Monday through Friday up there and then I come home on the weekends. I can tell you, New York is not my home. I spend time there now, but it isn't home. And I find myself talking a lot about home, thinking a lot about home. Mm -hmm. A few weeks ago, I went to work and found that while I was there, they had a tremendous snowstorm. St. Mary's got 22 inches by morning. And I knew I couldn't make it to Jamestown to my house so I went to a local hotel. Now this was a cheap hotel. It was the cheapest one I could find. I figured one night. They still had keys for the doors to the rooms. I don't think I've seen that since the 70s. Actual keys. What a night. The TV didn't work, so I called them. Oh, we'll come and get you another one. An hour later, they came with another TV. That one didn't work either. <laughs> internet was down. Well, you know, the storm. No internet. Light in the bathroom didn't work. I was afraid to ask them to come and change the bulb because I think they were going to blame it on the storm. So I just left that go. Did you ever try and shave in a dark bathroom in, with no windows and an interior? Yeah. It looked like somebody poked me with little. <laughs> and then I'm, I'm just saying my quick prayer to God, Lord, please make the shower be warm. And God said, wait. <laughs> because the shower was freezing. Anybody like taking a, a cold shower? That is the worst thing ever. But that was the easy stuff. So I curled in bed and I'm thinking, okay, a couple hours it'll be morning, here we go. And as I just, keep, things get quiet, I hear something chewing. <laughs> and then I hear it scurry across the ceiling. <laughs> 
I got up and I called the front desk and I told the attendant and they said, well, we've called the exterminator, but they can't come out because of the storm. They can't get here in this crazy snow. And I'm telling myself, it's only one night. It's only one night. It's temporary. It's not home. Now, this story, I hope, doesn't trivialize the struggles that many of you are going through. I don't mean to do that. And some of you might be offended by that. Steve, are you really comparing what happened in the, what's happening in the world today with a bad night in a cheap hotel? Well, that is exactly the way St. Teresa of Avila captured it. I wanted to share with you her words. She endured incredible loss in her life and endured years and years of suffering. Towards the end of her life, she said this, in light of heaven, the worst suffering on earth will be seen, will, will be seen to be no more serious than one night in an inconvenient hotel. And so at this hour, we cry out to our Father. And to some degree or another, we feel overwhelmed or lonely or anxious or afraid and frustrated and discouraged. But we must never forget we are just, just living here, that we're not home. You know, the first word in prayer Jesus speaks in John 17 is the word Father. Boy, that's a good place to take our stress, our disappointments, our trouble. As we wrap this up, though, I want you to notice the posture Jesus takes. I don't want us to miss this. John 17, 1, one more time. After Jesus said this, he looked towards heaven and prayed. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. Jesus looked towards heaven and prayed. And that's what we want to do together. That's the posture I want us to take. Because in this season, we're looking to the left and what the people on the left are saying. And we're looking to the right and what the people on the right are saying. And we're looking down at our feet way too much. But I think we want to look up. We want to look up to God, our Heavenly Father. And as we pray and as we transfer all of this stuff to him, I think we want to remind ourselves that we're not home yet. We are not home yet. Let's pray. Oh, Father God, I thank you.